this is a topic I really enjoy, which is outcome evaluation. I do uh, agree with what Greg had to say and what Angela had to say, and I uh, thank them and, uh, and OCAP for inviting me to speak with you guys today um, about the importance of using data. It's one of these things that I think is often talked about. Everyone says it's a thing we should do. People talk about they want to do it. You write grants, they ask you to put a logic model in, which suggests that you're going to collect data because the logic model is sort of the precursor to how you're going to approach that. But for a variety of reasons, I think folks struggle. They often do do it. They do it for a project, and the project goes away, and then they don't sustain the evaluation. And I think the challenge is how can we do evaluation and have it live on as part of the culture of our organizations? And so that's sort of the focus uh, I plan to take today. Uh, at different times in my career, there were opportunities for uh, for us to do evaluation. When I was in Santa Barbara uh, and working for the county, we actually contracted at that time with UC Santa Barbara, and they did a very robust approach to evaluation in partnership with us, which was great. Um, later, when I worked for CIMH, which is now CIBHS, they renamed themselves uh, California Behavioral Health you know, the California Institute for Behavioral Health Solutions. Um, we then uh, implemented an evaluation project and we supported evaluation for nonprofits and for counties. We created the infrastructure. They sent us the data and we sent them back the reports um, because they all were trying to approach evaluation in the same way. Um, and uh, then the work at nonprofit agencies, one of the agencies is quite large, the Children's Institute it's in Los Angeles. They specialize in trauma-informed care, um, and they created their own research and evaluation center made up of about a 10 staff research assistants, and they do their own evaluation and their own research. Not everyone is that large. I worked for a smaller nonprofit agency, and we had just a single half-time research assistant who helped us make use of our data. So people are in a variety of situations and a variety of opportunities. Um, and this group is quite diverse, so we ended up um, surveying, you guys were really kind to send back some information about your capacity. Some of you are affiliated with universities and you do robust evaluations and some of you are smaller and you're just looking at evaluation. And so hopefully the conversation today will cover all of those. It's kind of challenging to have it strike the right level, um, but that was sort of, sort of the idea. Um, and again, I think the overall goal was this notion of um, how do we make outcome evaluation or use of data practical? How can we embed it into the culture of our organization? And how can it live on, you know, past a particular project? Sometimes the challenge is you evaluate for a project, but you have multiple funding streams, and every funding stream wants evaluation. If you're fortunate, you have some funding streams that have no evaluation specific requirements, so you get to do what you want, it's discretionary money. And then the challenge about evaluation for project or evaluation for your agency, because your agency is often more than one project and more than one funding source. And sometimes the efforts to do the evaluations, they don't line up. So we'll talk about that too. And some of you work with others, and then you're reliant on them to give you data. And then there's uh, inevitably reasons why that can't be done. You know, it's privacy, you don't have a release, we don't have an agreement, you don't have an MOU, I can't send you the data, it's a, it's a million reasons why. So we'll talk about some of those levels too. Um, but again, um, this will just be the start, obviously, with this many agencies represented and those who are, who are joining remotely, it's not going to be possible to talk about the particulars, but hopefully lay out the concepts that allow you to take the next step. I'm hopefully not standing in front of the screen. No, I'm not. Okay. Standing in front of you guys. You guys can't see the screen, right? They can see the screen. Oh, you have other screens. This is such a well-equipped room. <laughs> so this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, it is color-coded. Uh, so the blue areas end up having blue background slides. This orange has orange backgrounds. This is as clever as I get. You'll see no graphics, but you will see color coding. So. Um, so in, in, a, in a practical approach to evaluation, I like to start by talking about the audience. So who is the evaluation for and what do they want to know or what do I want them to know? 
uh, because I think sometimes we talk about evaluation sort of in a vacuum and we don't think about who's using the reports that are going to come out of that evaluation. And, and in my opinion, from a practical perspective, it's helpful to know who you intend the evaluation for, who's your target audience, and what are you trying to tell them. I like to say what are you trying to convince them, except for with evaluation we're hoping it says what we want. Sometimes it doesn't and we need to be open to that. But nonetheless, what do we want them to know about our work? And then, um, and then uh, the second topic will be how will you report your data? Actually, that comes at the end in sequentially. And you collect the data, you store the data, you analyze the data, you report the data. But it's helpful to talk about, to think about what it's going to look like before you start your data collection and, your, uh, and, your, and decide what information you're going to use because you sort of want to envision what it is you're going to be sharing with people. And that sort of tells you what kind of data you may want to be using. And then we'll talk about what data you have whoops, and what data you want to collect. Sometimes you have all the data that you need. So I'll show you some examples later. Um, and the, the project we did when I was at CIMH, we only used 10 pieces of information to create all of our outcome reports. Uh, and the information wasn't shocking information, it was things like number of people, date they enrolled, date they ended, number of hours we saw them, their ethnicity, the language they spoke, and then we could say things like how many people did we serve, and uh, what was the ethnic and gender breakup, how were they represented, and what was the duration of services we provided, and how many times did we see them. And then we had a simple outcome measure that we gave pre and post, and we showed impact. It was 10 pieces of information, eight of which we already had. And the only ones we didn't have was the pre and post measure, which we'll talk about later. That tends to, to be the thing that people get stuck on. How am I going to show impact? What measure should I choose? I should research all the measures. I should find the perfect measure. Is it reliable? And is it valid? Is it more reliable and less valid? And how long does it take to administer? And does it be translated in 19 threshold languages? Can I use this measure? And then it turns out, and there's a dozen measures that all are about, you know, one slight, like, like slightly better than the other, and in which case the one that doesn't cost you anything is probably the one you should use. This is, a, this is a tip for the day. If it doesn't cost you anything, use that measure. So, um, and then how to compile and store the data, which also tends to confound people. We'll have to hire somebody and they'll create a data warehouse for us. Only it's going to cost us $500,000. And how are we going to store all the data? It's too much. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about different methods to do, to do that. We actually used Excel when we did our statewide project. So we supported data from over um, 100 sites, and we did it all in Excel. So I know it sounds shocking. You didn't have your, you know, a special online portal with online entry of data or something, some kind of data transfer, but no, people just sent us to, it, uh, to us in Excel workbooks. We created the Excel workbook. It was pre-formatted. People put in their data, and they sent it back to us. And we combined them and we did the reporting. Uh, we'll talk about analysis and then I'll show you some examples. Uh, and I appreciated Greg talking about prevention and the challenge of evaluating prevention because you want to see an outcome for something that didn't happen. Um, and so we'll talk about one of the, some of the examples I use come from the Mental Health Services Act evaluation of their statewide prevention programs, which were um, about reducing stigma and reducing suicide. Um, and so those are both challenging things to show, and I'll show you the data that they uh, used and the reports they had ran to their reports to their outcome evaluation. So I'll show you some examples of what they did with that. So that's sort of what we're going to do. Okay, so who's your audience? I came up with six audiences. You can come up with more audiences. It's not an endless list. Um, I thought about funders, so like OCAP could be your audience, uh, or an agency that gives you a grant. Uh, boards of directors or an oversight group, so they want, you know, to know what you're doing and how good the agency is. Your managers, so the people who run your programs are sometimes your audience. Um, your direct line staff, the people who actually do the work with the clients in the community could be your audience. The clients could be your audience, so your participants. Um, or you could have academics or professionals in the field if you're trying to influence. Um, Greg actually mentioned politicians. I didn't even put them up, policymakers as an audience, but they're a good one. Um, uh, so we could add that to our list. Um, so if you're a funder, 
So if I'm in the mind of a funder, what does a funder want to know? They tend to want to know, this is not what, it's not the end all, but they tend to want to know, are the funds being used in the expected way? You told us you were going to do something, you told us you were going to see people, build something, provide something. They want to know, did you do that? Are you providing the services the way that was expected? Did clients, uh, uh, did you serve the clients that you expected? Are you having the impact with those people that you expected? So it's sort of specific to the funding they gave it to you. Um, in terms of the expected impact, typically it's specific to that particular program, not the whole work of your agency, but in terms of what they funded. Are you having the impact that they expected? Okay. We will come back to this topic about um, deciding what is the right impact for a particular grant. I tend to think when we write grants, we talk about ambitious impacts, but when we get the grant, we have the sober realization that the amount of money that we got may not be quite enough to achieve the impact that we said we were going to, you know, and so we talk about doing training that will change people's minds, and then we talk about showing reductions in child maltreatment, and I'm not sure that, you know, we can make that leap that we have enough resources to see that all the way through. But we'll come back and talk about that. Uh, boards of directors and oversight. So they tend to want to know about the whole, pro, you know, the whole agency. How is the whole agency doing? How big is our reach? How many people do we touch which are, with, with all of our services? And what do we get? How, how, how do those people improve? And they don't tend to want to know about the improvements within any one program. So I work with this agency in LA, the Children's Institute. Uh, they're about a $75 million agency. They have Head Start programs. They have mental health programs. They have child welfare um, uh, treatment and prevention programs, about 30 programs in all. So they don't want to know the mental health outcome and the outcome of the, you know, um, the prevention program and the head. They want to know overall how are we doing, not a whole litany of things. So a way to roll those outcomes up. And they also think about well, what, will, what will impress a donor. So they're always talking about this. We should have a meeting because they're out fundraising. It's a nonprofit agency and they want to know what's going to impress a donor. And what impresses a donor may not be what impresses a funder. They have different sensibilities. Oftentimes the donor is impressed by a really good story about a client, a qualitative as opposed to a quantitative. So, and sometimes you can pair the two. I'll show you some examples of what Riverside County did. They recently had their prevention and early intervention symposium, which is their Mental Health Services Act funded initiative, and they did a prevention works presentation, and they do something clever where they show a quantitative outcome and then a quote from a participant, which kind of um, can be compelling. So agency managers, so I think the information agencies managers want to look at is the most robust. So the agency managers are the people who are responsible to make sure your agency does what it's supposed to do. Um, and so I, I sometimes think that they're the immune system of your organization. They make sure that everything is healthy and robust and that when people drift, they pull it back into order. So they want to know lots of things. They want to know are you in compliance with whatever your funders are asking. It's usually the agency manager who's on top of that. They want to know are staff doing what they're expected? Are they seeing the numbers of people? they're supposed to, or doing the number of activities they're supposed to. Are you seeing the number of clients? Are they getting the level of service? If you're doing a particular kind of program, are you doing that program correctly? So a number of you do a financial literacy program, YMYK, do I have the acronym right? Um, and so that must have features, like a way it's supposed to be done, right? So then these folks want to know, are you doing it correctly, like fidelity to the model? What's the client experience? So Greg mentioned that, or do clients, and by the way, I, I wrote client experience and not client satisfaction. Satisfaction doesn't tend to be a great outcome measure because almost always it's in the upper 90s. So people rarely tell you they're unhappy with services or unhappy with you, even when they don't get good outcomes, as long as you don't upset them. So if you're nice to them but they don't get great outcomes, they'll often tell you they're satisfied. But client experience is more about responsiveness, it's about the experience and care, um, and that tends to be a more sensitive measure. But anyway, client experience. Achievement of client outcomes, are people getting better? And then sometimes managers want to know, uh, do a kind of a thing where you look at your best, your clients who get your best outcomes and the clients who got the worst outcomes. 
and see whether or not you can see a difference between those two subsets of clients. So what characteristics are associated with the people who had the absolute best, so your highest performing clients, and what were the characteristics of the lowest? It, was it related to how we did the program? Was it related to their circumstances? Are they different? It's coming from different circumstances when we did the same thing? Or are they coming from different circumstances? So, you know, it's like children. When you have one child, so I have two children. I had my first child. I thought, I'm a wonderful parent. <laughs> I can't believe all the things I'm doing and raising my child. And, you know, he does everything. And, and I'm just like, oh, look, how great I am. Then I had a second child. <laughs> Entirely different. I'm exactly the same. And I realized it has nothing to do with me. They just come into the world a certain way. And, you know, you're there to support them and help them along. I kind of decided parenting is a little bit like being sunshine and water, and they're a little bit like plants. You just don't know what kind of plants they're going to be. And they grow the way they want to grow. So uh, Marie Poulton, she's uh, from uh, USC uh, and Children's Hospital, and she's an early childhood researcher. And she talks about kids as dandelions and, um, and orchids. And so an orchid is a child that requires a great deal of attention, south-facing light, a little bit of water, not too much, not too little. And the dandelions grow everywhere, you know, the cracks in the sidewalks, <laughs> places you don't want them to grow. And uh, you only have to have one orchid and one dandelion to realize that it's really all about, it's all about them. But at any rate, so, um, so it's good to find out whether or not is it us. Did we do something different? And that's why we get different outcomes for the highest and the, and the least successful of our clients. Or is it they come from different circumstances and we have different populations of people that need different kinds of strategies. So that's the kinds of things managers look at because that's more of a quality improvement. Kind, that's where your quality improvement sort of uh, efforts tend to fit, which is a kind of use of data. Uh, your direct staff. So your direct staffs are not unlike your board of directors. They want to know they're part of something grand because I'm working every day and I have a, a, a caseload of 10 or 20 or 30 people and some of them do well and some of them don't, don't do well and they have crises and I'm running around and I'm just immersed in it. And I don't see the whole forest, right? I just see my trees. And they like, a, they like to know they're, they're part of something grand. They want to know that we see many people and those many people get better get better outcomes, have favorable outcomes. And it's motivating. It's motivating to go home at the end of the day and to be able to say, you know, I work for such and such an agency and we do the most amazing work. I just learned we see, you know, 1,000 people and, you know, they have these fabulous outcomes. So that's, and it's, it's motivating to staff. Um, it turns out when you look at staff, retention, and that's sort of a big deal for nonprofit agencies, and non the average nonprofit will lose between 20 and 25 percent of their staff a year. So that is a lot of training and retraining. And salary is one of the reasons people uh, stay with an agency, but it turns out that when you reach a certain level of salary, it's not the primary reason people stay. The primary reason has to do with their direct supervisor. It turns out if you don't like your direct supervisor, that'll push you out. Um, and they want to be part of something grand. They want to be part of something that's really having an impact in the world. And how does, it, how does a person know that if they never get to see any data, right? They just have their own personal experience with their own handful of clients, which may be favorable, may be challenging, you know, depending on the nature of the work. Um, this is my favorite one, which is clients. Uh, folks rarely do this, but I really love this one. So if I'm a client, I want to know, are you seeing people like me? I'm wanting to know what can I expect in terms of the level of participation. I want to know what, what the experience of other people who were in your program was like, and I want to know what the outcomes I can expect are. So it could read something like this. So one of the big evidence-based practices that um, is commonly used by child-serving agencies is the trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy program. So wouldn't it be nice if you had a child who had a trauma history and you were going to be served by an agency and they say, we have served 5,000 kids with a trauma history. And, um, and we use this evidence-based practice called trauma-focused CBT, and this is what you can expect. It takes roughly 12 to 16 sessions, and it involves these kinds of steps. And 9 out of 10 people who start finish, and 9 out of 10 of the kids who finish show a, a significant improvement, right? So that would be nice. And it would have the effect of uh, creating an expectation of positive outcome 
which in itself is probably going to lead to a positive outcome because if you, in, in a social service context, if you go in expecting a favorable outcome, you are more likely to have a favorable outcome. And so this way you can set that sort of favorable outcome. Uh, and then the last one is academics. And they tend to want to know more things precisely. So tell me about the characteristics of your program. Tell me about the characteristics of the clients you served. Tell me what the service levels were like. Tell me what outcomes you achieved. And most importantly, tell me why you think that your, out, your program is responsible for that outcome. So the notion of confidence and causality, right? And so different research strategies have different ways of increasing your confidence in the, in the assurance that your program caused that outcome. So my point about this is, is, is that depending on the nature of your audience and what you're trying to, to, to achieve by sharing data, are you increasing client expectation of positive outcomes? Are you increasing line staff morale? Are you doing quality improvement? Are you trying to uh, solicit a donor? Are you trying to impress a funder? Are you trying to um, change the mind of a policymaker? The nature of the data you share will look different. Could be the same underlying data set, rolled up, analyzed, and presented differently or it may affect how you collect the data in the first place, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But knowing where you're going, what you're planning to do with the data is really helpful because, um, and we'll talk about this, when you start to share reports and you get the benefit of sharing it, it motivates the culture of doing it. So sometimes what happens is we collect data but we don't share it, in which case the people who are involved in the collection don't see the benefits of collecting it, and they think it's busy work, which then means they don't take it very seriously, so they don't do it very well. And then when you're looking at the data, you're saying, oh, well, the data is incomplete. We can't draw any conclusions from this. And it becomes this kind of, so I'm going to encourage, and I, there's a slide that will talk about this. The best thing you can do is start small and report something, even if it's not great. Because when you begin to report it, it creates a feedback loop from the audience who's the recipient of that data. And if the data is not good, then they demand more better data, but at least they're interested in data. And it motivates then a greater use of data. The, the thing I would least encourage you to do is have an ambitious, broad data and evaluation strategy with many facets and much data that you don't, you don't consistently collect in which, and then you rarely report, then those things tend to wither a little bit. Okay, so audiences. So reporting data. So think about sharing data at the outset before you start to collect data specific to a project. What do you want to communicate? What's most salient? How will you share the data? Sometimes we know more, oftentimes we know more than we need to share. Not everything we know. You ever been with someone who says something out loud and you say to them, you know, just because you think it doesn't mean you have to speak it. You know what I'm talking about? It's probably a, a, a spouse of yours, a partner. You go out and you're like, you know what? Just because you think it. So the same thing. We know lots of things. We don't have to share everything we know. People don't want to know everything we know about the ins and outs of your program. People want to know or you want them to know the thing that is most relevant to the decision that they're making. And you, data is really about influencing decisions. And so your audience is a decision maker and you're trying to influence a decision. If your audience is a client, you're influencing expectation of positive outcome. If your client is, your audience is your direct staff, you're influencing morale. If the audience is a donor, you're, in, you're influencing giving of, of funding. If your audience is a policymaker, then you're influencing a policy decision, right? And you want to give them the, the data that supports the decision that you're trying to influence. That make sense? Um, reports can be simple and straightforward. Oftentimes they're better simple and straightforward. Depending on your decision makers, you can't count them to read very much. So these big reports are great if that's academics is your audience. You know what I'm talking about? But the one-page dashboard report is much more compelling if your audience is a board of director, a policymaker, some of your line staff who aren't going to read more than you know, you would put in an email. 
can't even get staff to read the email. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? So simple and straightforward. You can have all the backup and all the context for anyone who wants it. Not everything needs to be put in that. Data share drives interest in data used. You don't share it, no one's, then you don't influence anything. The more you share it, the more people will want it. So you've got to get it out there. If you have a plan to do evaluation and you're not doing it now, it's got to get out this year. If you don't put it out, it's not, you're not going to use it. I like every six months. Put something in front of people that's your intended audience and that will motivate you to continue to do it. What is shared may vary by the audience. We talked about that. Um, information about, and, and then in terms of the, of the kinds of data, almost always the data falls into a handful of categories. Information about who you're serving, your participants. Sometimes I say clients, sometimes I say participants, because sometimes you guys are training people like professionals and staff, and sometimes you're seeing individuals like uh, financial literacy. So I'm trying to be, I guess they're all clients of a sort. I guess they're all participants of a sort. In mental health now, they're calling them all consumers. That's a new word, not clients anymore. Okay. We went from patient to client to consumer. Um, uh, information about your intervention. So what did you do? Information about your impact, so what changed. Information about how you collected your information and drew your conclusions. Almost always that's what your reports are going to include. Something about who you served, something about what you did, something about how it changed them, and something about how you know it. That's pretty much it. And you can put it in a page or you can put it in a hundred pages. But it always ends up being sort of more or less the same four areas of information, right? So it can be as simple as four sentences. You know, we had a financial literacy program. We served 100 families who come from a particular background. Um, we provided them YMYK. I'm not sure I know exactly what the features are, but I would say, right? Oh, YMYG. Oh, thank you. YMYG. I have the wrong one. I don't even know what K is. And then, you know, this is what that intervention is. It's about teaching people, I guess, to save money, invest money for the future. Uh, information, of, and then you'll say that uh, 8 out of 10 of the people who completed, well, you'll say uh, 9 out of 10 of the people who started finished Y, Y, wow, now YMYG, YMYG. <laughs> I'm all over now. And uh, and of those that finished, eight of them opened a new bank account, seven of them saved a thousand dollars for a school fund, for their child, whatever the right? And and you'll say we collected this information um, at the start and the end of our uh, YMYG ten session, fifteen session, three session um, a program. Right? That's it just like four pieces of information and you have an outcome report. Okay, so um, impact information. This tends to be where people have the greatest challenge. How, the, the idea of what am I going to use to show the impact. Easy to talk about client characteristics. Easy to talk about interventions because this is our program. We know what we're doing. Hard to know what is our impact and right is, what is the right level of impact. Your logic models may be perfect for this because your logic models can be the jumping off point for the impact. They talk about your resources and they talk about who you're serving, what you're going to do, and then usually like a short-term, a, a mid-term, and a long-term kind of outcomes. So those are sort of the categories of impacts and might be a, a way for you to get a handle on that. A couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, look at what are your most important outcomes. Not everything you might do needs to be the focus of data collection. It might be more data to be collected than you will collect. So just keep it simple. What's the most important outcome? Balanced by what is the most likely outcome given your resources. So don't choose the outcome that's very unlikely to see in the window of time that you're trying to report. Choose the most important outcome given the, the resources that you have available. So if your training program, the most likely outcome is change in beliefs, change in knowledge. That may lead to things down the road, but probably not things you're going to see in a reasonable window of time, and it's going to be hard to attribute it directly to your training, right? So, you know, what can you see? And yes, it is true that if uh, 
uh, parents of young children, I think it's $3,000. If they set aside $3,000, they say $3,000 in a year, the likelihood that their children will grow up to um, earn more money is dramatically increased. So it's a great thing to do. To talk about their children's income as your outcome seems like an unrealistic thing to tie to your YMYG program. But a bank account, $1,000 saved, something like that is much more realistic. So it needs to be realistic given your resources. And then you can talk later about the implications of that based on the literature. Um, and then also think about what is, which outcome, um, what are the ways you're going to measure the outcome and which of those measurement methods is most practical. And we'll talk about that too. Sometimes I can use a survey, a self-report survey, my clients completed, a staff report survey, my staff completed. Sometimes it's an observation. Sometimes it's just a, a, a thing we record, what I'm refer I'll refer to later as records, like a person's income. How do I know it? They don't fill out a questionnaire. They just tell me their income, and then I ask them later, and they tell me their income. So that's how, you know what I mean? It's just something that we record, not a, not a measure that we administer. Um, and a lot of time that's suitable too. So we'll talk about those different ways to look at impact. But I think this is where people get stuck and they look for sometimes overly complicated ways to measure things that are more straightforward. So um, when I was in undergrad, a long, long time ago, um, I was taking a, a, a psychology class and the professor was sharing, apparently at the time they wanted to um, in, uh, identify individuals who could work at these remote outposts. This was in Alaska. Uh, and they were gonna live by themselves for six months in some uh, remote outpost. And they wanted to know psychologically who could do that. So they would look for all the methods of identifying these people. They could give them like a Rorschach, they could give them an MMPI, personality measures, they could, you know, all these elaborate tests. Uh, that turns out the best measure uh, is to ask them, do you think you would do okay for six months in a remote by yourself? That turned out to be the best predictor. So sometimes the impact measure doesn't require, I know there's a lot of talk about ACEs and trauma measures and how are we going to, you know, and, 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 and a lot of interest in developing trauma measures. I'm part of a project with LA County and they're, uh, they've engaged the services of an agency to develop an outcome measure. And that's right, so there's lots of talk about this, um, which is interesting and useful, but sometimes there are more straightforward ways to get the answers to the questions that you want. Um, and you need, to, you need to decide what makes sense in, in the context of your agency. Are you doing an academic study? If you're not doing an academic study, you may not need the most rigorous approach. You may need something that's compelling, you know, and that, and that um, you know, um, makes the point you're trying to. Okay, collecting data. So um, what, di what information do you have? And what additional information might you need to collect? So almost always, we have a bunch of data. We don't think of it as data, we think of it as information, enrollment information, the things people do when they sign up for services, like they tell us their name, and they tell us their date of birth, and they tell us sometimes their income, because it's uh, uh, for low-income families, or, they or they're Medi-Cal eligible, which is a proxy measure of their income. You know what I mean? So we have a whole bunch of stuff. We know their children, we know how old their children are, we know, we know where they go to school, or what have you. You know stuff about what you do. You know how often you see them. You see them one time, you see them multiple times. You know what services you're giving them, if it's specific to a program or something generic like case management. Typically the thing we don't have is the impact measure, although even then sometimes we do. Sometimes we're doing a pre and post measure. Sometimes we do a satisfaction survey or a client experience survey. Sometimes we're using some standard standardized measure of, you know, like a strengthening families measure or, a, or an, uh, an assets measure, or strengths and, and resources measure, or sometimes we're using uh, some kind of measure of um, emotional wellness. Um, or maybe we're not using any measures at all. Maybe we're collecting other information about their income or their living situation, you know, which are outcomes in themselves in terms of how often they move, how stable their situation is. Um, so, uh, so it's good to take stock of what you have before you decide what you're going to collect and then only collect the difference. 
I think there's a tendency when we do evaluation to create forms and to have our staff go out and, cre and collect everything, even though a good portion of what we put on our forms we already have because they're enrolled in our programs, right, which you don't need twice. You just need a way of combining what you have with what you need. Plus, it's also good for your staff because staff don't like to have to collect things multiple times, which tends to be a burden. Um, and so in terms of impacts, you may think about change in circumstances. You may think about changes in beliefs, in attitudes, in feelings, in behaviors. So we have to think broadly about outcome measures. I think people tend to think only in terms of questionnaires, but questionnaires aren't um, the only kind of outcome measure, and oftentimes they're not the best because a questionnaire is often just a proxy measure for something we don't think we can measure, right, which is something in their real life. If you can measure it in their real life, then just measure it, you know what I mean, like income, as opposed to a proxy measure. Proxy measures are for things that aren't easy to measure in real life, like are you happy? <laughs> Uh, I can't, it's not easy for me to tell you, to tell if you're happy, but I can ask you to indicate on a scale of 1 to 10 how happy you are. Although I can tell if you have friends, I can, you know, which is probably people who have friends are probably, you know, happy. Or if you're, you know, if you're active, if you're doing meaningful things, which are all sort of indications of being happy too. Um, in, in terms of collecting data, uh, what we tend to see is that when there's strong organizational commitment to data, data is collected better. When people are asked to collect data, but at the top of the organization, there's not really, they don't really value data, it tends to, people don't tend to value collecting it either, and you get sketchy, incomplete data. Um, so we need to take into account the commitment and the organizational capacity. So who's going to collect your data? Some agencies have people who are dedicated, which is great the agency I mentioned that has their research and evaluation team, and some do not. Sometimes the data is collected by the staff who do the programs, which is fine. Um, but to think about who's going to do the data collection. Create a cro concrete protocol. I can't tell you how often this is overlooked. If you're going to collect data, don't expect your staff to know what to collect. Like I have to get this form and this form and this form and take it to my meeting. Have it in packets. I know it sounds simple, but a lot of folks don't do this. Mm -hmm. So in the old days, we used to do them in manila envelopes, and we would put all the forms, and we would label it for first session for YMYG program. You know, and there would be another packet that would say six months, YMYG. We had different packets for different age kids, for the zero to five-year-olds, for the teenagers, because they had different measures. Everything is packets. You just take the packet. You take it to your client, you fill it out, you bring it back. When we were more sophisticated, we turned them into PDFs, and they sat on a shared drive, right? And all you had to do was go in and click the packet and print it, and it was all the measures that you were supposed to hold, all the information, everything together. I know it sounds simple, but the idea that people have to know what they have to collect as opposed to just give it to them to collect. We also... Um, had a system where they could just scan it back to us or send it back to us. Sometimes we ask the people who collect it to score it, and that tends to be more challenging. If you're small, you can do that. The value is that they can use the scores in the services they're providing if the measures are useful for that. The disadvantage is that tends to be a delay, and so you think about whether you want to have it sent somewhere and they score it and the results get sent back which is probably a more reliable way to do it. If you are collecting cross-agency, then everything I just said is magnified. So you have to go from making it easy to use to making it very easy to use. The difference there is the word very. Uh, you ha again, you have to have packets, and you have to give it to your partners, and you have to remove every barrier. If they have concerns about HIPAA, then you become a business associate and then you're allowed to share information. If you, if you need a release of information, then when you enroll your clients, you include a sheet that says, because of our commitment to uh, quality assurance, we evaluate what we do, and they sign a consent when they enroll, and then the consent goes away. If they're not sure how to, to do the data, you give them a packet. If they're not sure how to use Excel, you give them a pre-formatted Excel template. Whatever they need, you give it to them first. Don't expect another agency who you're reliant on to give you data to do anything extra 
you've got to just like all they have to do is just like like just like if they were pushing it out like oh, here's the data everything else it just falls in place because you put it all together for them and remove all those barriers so that uh, CIMH project I mentioned I think uh, we had about a hundred agencies we gave them the templates, we gave them the outcome measures, we gave them the instructions, and all they did was put numbers into a spreadsheet and attach it to an email and send it back so that it's as straightforward as possible um, to, el to eliminate those barriers. Storing data. So I've seen agencies spend lots of money storing data which is fine, to build data warehouses. This agency, Children's Institute, built a data warehouse. When I was at CMH, we used Excel workbooks. So you can have an electronic health record. That would be great, robust, dynamic. Um, you can have a data warehouse, which is lovely, and you can merge data from multiple places. You can have an Excel workbook, works just as well. You can have everything in hard copies. And you can do it the way we did it years ago where you would take pieces of paper and you would take scores, then you had this thing called graph paper, which is like Excel with nothing automated, and we would write numbers into columns and we would add them up and we would do things with them mathematically. So I know it sounds crazy, but, but we're not talking about, for some of our programs, it doesn't have to be a very sophisticated thing. Numbers of people who were in our program what we provided and how they how likely they are to have a bank account or a savings account it's very compelling and it doesn't require a sophisticated electronic support system to do that if you're larger and you have the resources great and if and maybe you have a need for an electronic health system anyways wonderful then you can use it although even then i've seen people try to build outcomes into their electronic health system only to find out it doesn't go easily and then they spend all this time trying to make it work when they didn't need to all they needed to do was enter it into an excel spreadsheet i'm not talking about statistics here it's lovely if you can do, you know, statistical significance tests or do something fancy. You don't need to for it to be compelling. And I'll show you some examples. Um, data analysis. So um, there's lots of ways to make your data illuminating and compelling. You can use data to drive innovation and to support quality improvement, which is kind of that manager level, to inspire governmental agencies who fund you, like say OCAP, or private philanthropy, so somebody who is in the private sector, uh, or to motivate staff or to build hope, right? So different ways to use data, they require a different approach. And not everyone requires something rigorous and something statistical for it to be compelling. Interestingly enough, if you go and you testify, like, you know, for the, for the, at a state hearing, people seem very moved by personal examples having nothing to do with quantitative data. And sometimes it's a single incident, a single story. Um, who watched the Mr. Rogers documentary movie? Yeah, I grew up with Mr. Rogers, who's so sweet to me. And, uh, uh, and, and there's a, a part in the movie where he does a, he, 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 they were going to cut funding to public television and he testifies, uh, uh, in Congress. And they, I don't know if it's true or not, but the movie attributes the decision to support funding to his testimony, which had nothing to do with data. It had to do with a heartfelt and sincere, uh, conversation about his experience helping young children it's, uh, through his TV show. So, uh, and through the work of, of public television. And so sometimes that's very compelling. So it's perfectly fine. And that is also use of data, right? So use of data is not only the things you read in research. That is a use of data. That is not the only use of data. Um, intent is important. So when you approach using data and you approach analysis, favorable outcomes are expected. You're doing this, you think you're getting good outcomes, but you need to also be receptive to learning that there's room for improvement. So if we go into and we create a culture of using data, it can't only be to affirm what we already believe, it must also be an openness to learning something that may not be what we thought. And we also have to avoid the tendency to find data that supports our results. That's not, that's not the intent behind use of data. You, um, uh, you need to be open to the idea that 
you know, that the results are different. You want to you want to find the results that the data show you, right? And and I say this because I really believe that there are many ways to use data, and they can be compelling. But that's not to mean that we simply say things that we want people to believe, and we say it's because the data says it. But that we we're open in how we approach using the data. So even if I have conversations with people, and I'm using qualitative data, then you know it's it's not in keeping with the fair use of data for me to find the one person who liked it when nine other people told me it was terrible, that wouldn't be in keeping with this intent. So my point is only there are many ways to use data, but for it to be compelling in the long run and for it to be authentic, it does have to be guided by this openness. So there are different ways um, that we can approach gathering the data, but we don't want it to be prejudicial from the outset, right? We want to be able to be open to the results depending on how we collect the data. Um, so different ways we can collect data. We can collect data at one point in time. So some of the things we do just happen one time. I do a training. There is no pre-post. I'm just going to ask you at the end of the, I mean, I can do a pre-training and a post-training. Or I can just ask you at the end, you know, did this change any, you know, your beliefs? Did this change your attitudes? And I'll show you some examples of what the state did with that. Um, uh, you can, you can, uh, so that would be, a single point in time would be suitable for a single event like a training. You'd ask what was learned, attitudes. Are they prepared to do something different? You can do pre-post evaluation. That is most suitable when you have an intervention that is likely to produce a change. And you're going to do it pre and you're going to do it post. And then you're going to show that change. Uh, and that is the type that's most often done within a whole agency. Every client served, we do pre-post, that kind of thing. LA County does that for their prevention and early intervention, their mental health program. Um, they've done that with 150,000 kids pre-post data, so they're a very big system. So Greg said that the child welfare system is about six billion, so LA County's mental health program is two billion a year, so it is a very large program. Um, and so they have lots of data, and it's all pre-post. Every single provider, 150 providers, all collect the data in the same way, so they do pre-post on every client. However, you don't always have to do an all clients pre-post approach. I think there's lots of merit to sampling. And sampling would be suitable if you want to show an impact for a particular audience and there isn't a need to do it for each and every client or it's not part of your everyday approach. So sometimes what happens is we set ourselves up to do pre-post with every client and we get this really bad return rate, which makes it hard to make use of our data. A sampling approach is very valid as long as you sample a large enough group of folks and your sampling is not prejudicial. So I'm not only choosing people who complete, but I'm choosing people as a random subset. I can talk to, I can gather data from 10 or 20 families or individuals, and I can collect information pre and post, and it might be lower cost to my agency. I can hire someone to do it with a small amount of money or something, uh, and it can be very compelling. Well done sampling, and I'll show you some examples of that, is as, is as compelling as pre-post. So it's different methods as long as the sample is done well. And I think this is sampling is often overlooked, and it can allow us to do things we don't easily do with across the board because we can do something more intensive. I could gather data. I can also talk to them individually. I can get personal experiences. So it's another way to do it. And by the way, I can sample my best. I can take, say I served 500 families and say, 50 of them were stars, and 50 of them had the, the lowest improvement. Maybe they got worse. I can sample 10 from the top and 10 from the bottom and answer very interesting things I can't easily do with the pre pros across the board. Um, I can do qualitative evaluation, which is suitable for understanding client experience, which you don't easily see in a data set, like a quantitative data set. Also, if I want to explore impacts and mechanisms, I know it works, it seems to work, but I don't know why it works. We did many things. One of the things we did was most important to you. Hard to see that, like a wraparound approach. What was most influential? Was it the child and family team? Was it the flex funds? Was it the mental health? Was it what was mo what you have to talk to people, right, and ask them? And that, that's where a qualitative study. So again, we shouldn't think about only one way to do data gathering and use of data. 
Um, we can measure things uh, in, in terms of impact. We can measure changes in attitudes and beliefs. We can measure change in intention, so intention to do things differently, save money. We can change behavior. So I know how to save money. I believe saving money is important. I intend to save money. I actually have an account, right? So an attitude, an intention, a behavior. I can gather it as a rating. Staff can complete the rating. I can complete it on myself. I can complete it on my child. So multiple ways I can do ratings. By the way, when staff do ratings, it's much easier to get the data than when you have your participants do the ratings. I can look at records like income, living situation, arrest records, uh, child abuse report records. I can look at observations like you might do in a Head Start program, in an early childhood program. I can have a structured interview like I might in a qualitative study or some kind of a, a sampling. I can do a focus group, which would be often done in a qualitative study. I can use third-party data, so data that's not my data. But if I'm doing a big enough project, I'll show you an example of this. I can use data that comes from some other source, but for which I think reflects on my intervention. So we'll talk about that. So lots of ways to get data. Uh, it can be simple and still compelling. Numbers of people, average length of service, change in impact. It does not have to be a big and elaborate process. So examples. This is kind of hard to see. This comes from uh, Rand did the analysis. So Cal Mesa, Cal MHSA, he is a consortium of county to do statewide PEI projects, and this is a summary of their findings. But they did a um, they did a, a anti-stigma mental health campaign. 81% of all Californians are aware of the campaign, the statewide mental health campaign, um, which is Know the Signs and Each Mind Matters. The Know the Signs is for suicide prevention and Each Mind Matters is about mental health in general. I guess eight out of 10 of us know this. <laughs> when I would, uh, 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 at home in LA, I take the bus off into work and they had a, a Know the Signs uh, uh, on a placard on the bus. So I'm one of the 81%. So that's, that's a statistic of reach, 81%. 15.4% more Californians who were exposed to the Each Mind campaign were likely to get services than those that were not. So they uh, did a sampling. They identified a group of individuals who had seen the campaign and a group of individuals who hadn't seen the campaign. And they looked at the same one year period to see if they enrolled in services or not. And that's how they ended up with that statistic. So 81% of the people saw the campaign, and if you saw the campaign, you were 15% more likely to obtain services. They went ahead and calculated how many people that was across a state of 40 million people. It turns out to be a lot. And then they turned, and then they did a, an analysis of how much money that saved, and they did a, we spent a dollar and we got a certain amount of money in return. And that's where you see this statistic here, 5 million spent, Six billion returned. That was based on their calculation when they extrapolated statewide. So, just an example of sort of a, uh, how they approached a statewide campaign. How did they know 81% of people saw that? It's because they sampled and they called people and they asked them, "Have you seen this campaign?" Right? Which is practic a practical approach. Um, they did training as part of Mental Health Services Act. This is also from Rand. Uh, and they looked at, um, this was training for teachers, and they did a training about mental health, uh, and they asked about confidence to intervene, confidence to refer, likelihood to intervene, likelihood to refer, before and after the training. It's simple, it's compelling, um, and it speaks to intent, right? So this is sort of an intent level outcome, that they intend to intervene. They might have intervened, they might not have intervened, that's not shown in this study. Um, but in this study, they showed the intent. Uh, here I'm just crediting Riverside County when they did their prevention summit. So I'm borrowing slides from their presentation. So uh, these are their slides, which I think are really clever. This is the same data, by the way. Um, so many counties participate in Know the Signs campaign. They did their, um, they did their own uh, phone survey, uh, and they got this statistics. 91% um, said they'll be more supportive. 
66% will make a personal effort, 85% feel more comfortable talking about, and 92% treat others with mental illness with more respect based on exposure to the campaign. So what did they do? They simply called people and they asked them if they'd been exposed to the campaign and then they calculated these percentages, not statistical significance, just percentage of people who. They have a transition age youth project at Speakers Bureau, where transition age youth speakers speak to other transition age youth about mental illness. So they show a number about how many they reached. They show percentages of changes in terms of attitudes and beliefs. And they put a quote from a participant. So it's a kind of compelling way to present the data. Again, it's a number of people, a pre-post measure after a, tr a participation in a, in a or one-time measure of, uh, in a speaker bureau and a percentage. Um, here they're talking about a uh, number of kids who got one of two evidence-based practices. There's their reach, 4,930 participants, 2,353 in Triple P, 899 in Strengthening Families Program. They tell you how many completed. They tell you a little bit about the participants. Um, and then they talk about the outcomes in general, positive parenting, anxiety, depression decrease, parental competence increase, child behavior decrease. They have a quote. And then they show you a pre-post measure. Here they're using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. That was their outcome measure. They used it pre and post. You see their pre-score. You see their post-score. You see quotes. Right? So it's a handful of data, um, uh, a simple analysis. Again, no statistical significance here. Still compelling. This is a program they did for older adults. Here's the reach. They did four programs. It's on this prevention to early intervention continuum. PEARL's program is a program for depression in older adults. They use the PHQ-9. It's a nine question measure of depression, hence the, num the name PHQ-9. Here's the pre-score. Here's the post-score. Very compelling improvement. This program has given me hope. I'm looking forward to my future. All right. Um, this is a report that we did from the California Institute of Mental Health. Uh, this was based on uh, reports we did for LA County. So this is the cover page that talks about the report. This was from 2013. These are all of the agencies that submitted outcome data. So every one of these agencies had one of those pre-formatted Excel databases I told you about. They filled in the database. They simply put the numbers in. They were collecting um, uh, measures pre and post use of trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. That's the particular model being used here. Um, and, and then all of it was combined to make this report. So I'll show you a subset. So in this report, we show entry rate and we show dropout rate because we thought that that was relevant to, in this case, LA County. So 98% 98.9% of the people enrolled and 29.5% dropped out before they finished a full course of the intervention, which is good to know at the outset. I don't know if that's a high dropout rate or a low dropout rate, right? But it would bear some investigation. Here's information about the clients that were served, average age, gender, ethnicity, and primary diagnosis, all of which the agencies have because when they enroll clients and they provide services, this is standard information. Average length of treatment, so more information about the service. On average, it was 33 weeks long, totaling 27 sessions. So if I were doing this for, uh, for a family member, I would say, you know, this is the average uh, age of a client we served was 11. The average length of treatment was 27 sessions over 33 weeks. And then here you see an outcome measure called the Youth Outcome Questionnaire. It's a general measure completed by a parent about their child. This line here is the clinical cutoff for that measure. These kids are above the clinical cutoff. And then post, on average, they're below the clinical cutoff. So it's only slightly more sophisticated than what you saw at Riverside because they've included the clinical cutoff so you can see if it was significant. Now here they get a little bit fancy 
and they talk about reliable change. And reliable change has to, is, a, is a statistic. It's the level of change not accounted for by the standard error of measurement, which means if I get on the scale twice in the, you know, I get off a scale, on a scale, then I get on it again, it might not actually be exactly the same. It's a little bit of error in my measurement. So this says that the improvement we see can't be accounted for by that. So everyone in green showed um, uh, clinically relevant change. These people didn't get better but didn't get worse, and these people actually got worse between the time we started treatment and the time treatment ended, which is possible because our treatments aren't always powerful enough to overcome all of the factors that impinge on people. So uh, from the very same data, Rand did this, which I think is one of my favorites, particularly for prevention. So they're saying for these kids, for the kids that started below the clinical line, it's unrealistic to show improvement because they're already below. So they're not showing problems. It would be like if I'm trying to prevent you from having a cavity, but you don't have a cavity yet, and then I see you a year later and you still don't have a cavity. Did I prevent it by teaching you to brush your teeth? How do I know? You didn't have it and you still don't have it. So kids who were below the clinical cutoff weren't showing symptoms of, of serious disorder and they still weren't later. So nine out of 10 kids who were below stayed below. So the idea here is they prevented them from getting worse because their circumstances would have been such that they would have gotten worse. And some of them start off below, so they already have a cavity. Now I teach you to brush your teeth. Can I prevent you from having more cavities? Five out of 10 kids that were in the clinical range were not in the clinical range at the end of treatment. So it's just a different way to make the same point, right? Again, no statistics here. All they did was they took the subset of kids that started below, and at time two, were they still below? And they took the subset of kids that started above, and at time two, how many of them were below? That's it, no statistics. Just a reference to change to a clinical cutoff, which is in the measure. The measure tells you the clinical cutoff. You with me? Like on the PHQ-9, if you're above a five or whatever, then you're depressed. If you're below a five, you're just living life or something, right? And then, I, and then I like this example from Riverside. This is Riverside again. This is what you might do with a board of directors, right? Or what you might do with your line staff or what you might do with a the policymaker. They're not showing length of treatment. They're not showing characteristics of clients. They're not showing a lot of the detail I showed in some of the other examples. They're just showing the highest. 77% of people who had depressed who received services improved. 76% had less trauma. 70% of, uh, of parent involvement increased. Which program? This is across all their programs. Different programs, different measures, very simple statistic. Percentage of people in any of our five depression programs for any of our three age groups. They rolled it all up together and they came up with a single number. 77% of the people we served who had depression showed improvement, right? Very compelling. Now, you'd have to dig in to know all the particulars, which might be of interest to an academic, but to a policymaker, and you're wanting to make the point that the PEI money is well spent, the prevention and early intervention money, or for that money, matter OCAP money, it would be really compelling to be able to talk about a simple measure like this that rolls up. Um, this is from the Know the Signs campaign. This is adults exposed to the Know, uh, know the Signs campaign, which was uh, suicide prevention, confident in intervening. So this is change in attitude, pre and post Know the Signs. Um, and this is an example of third party. So there's a, not only did they know, do Know the Signs, they did a program called ASSIST. ASSIST is a suicide prevention gatekeepers model where they teach people uh, how to intervene with suicide, and those people then teach a bunch of people, and then those people intervene. So this is called the ASSIST program. And they did this extrapolation, and, and they projected, which I'm not going to show you, um, how many suicides they're preventing over 28 years. So very uh, complicated sort of analysis that they did. However, I was curious, because they represented they were preventing like 100,000 suicides over 
28 years. And I was like, oh, I wonder if this is really working. How would I know if the Know the Science was working in California? It's a very hard thing to know about preventing suicide because it doesn't happen all the time. So I thought, well, I'll look at the national data to see how we compare to the rest of the country. That would be sort of interesting. So here you see, this is from the CDC, I just off their website. This is California's suicide rate. It's, it's more or less flat, just a little bit above 10 per 100,000 people per capita. This is the national suicide rate. So over the very same period of time, 2012 to 2016, that know the signs was happening in California, California's suicide rate is flat, whereas the rest of the country at the very same time shows an increase in suicide rate, which is interesting. I don't know that that proves that know the signs prevented suicide, but it certainly is consistent with the idea California is doing something different from all the other states. What about from Oregon? What about from what? Maybe it's West Coast states. So I found this map. This actually comes from the Washington Post. Um, so this is 2005. This is uh, less than 10 per capita is the purple color, 10 to 12, 12 to 14, 14 to 16, so two-person increments per capita. So all of this, this is the lowest rates here, low down here, low over here, middle here, and then all of this, that's the higher suicide rates. You with me? And then in 2015, so this, do this fast enough. Okay, so if you look at this, yes, California suicide rate did edge up a little bit. It went from purple to blue, but the rest of the country, or a lot of the country, edged up even further. So here's Washington and Oregon. They were there, and now they're, and now they're there. Probably not accountable by the West Coast is protected because they're West Coast states and they seem to have made a big jump. Again, this is not like I don't, you know, all of these incremental little squares that account for where they did this, but it is it is still nonetheless compelling. So I could show this data and I could say, isn't it interesting that we did this campaign and all of this work in the Mental Health Services Act? and we are more or less holding flat when the rest of the country is increasing, and the pattern is very broad in terms of even some of the, the, the parts of the country that were protected here end up showing big bump ups in their suicide rate. So again, it's third party data. It's not data I collected. I took a, this is particularly relevant if you're trying to change a whole community and you want to know, did your community initiative have an effect? It's hard to do that unless you can take some metric in your community and then compare it to, like, like Kids Count, that, you know, that report that comes out. Uh, you could look at that, for example, you know, you could see California counties and you could see if your county looks different. But there are ways to use third party data that are compelling. So then in terms of wrapping up, and I think I maybe ran just a little bit long, but let's just stretch out our lunch break. Uh, <laughs> data use culture. Uh, so it needs to be that you want your data to be valued. You want to be creative, but un undaunted by barriers. Because oftentimes we start these things and then we, we run into something and we don't go on. Share data reports earlier. The earlier to share it, the more likely you are to use it and people are going to value it. Focus on the practical, not necessarily the most elaborate. A little data collected and analyzed with integrity and shared frequently is more, more impactful than a lot of data that's inconsistently collected and rarely reported. So, um, and my contact information if you have any questions.